Well, before we begin, I'm going to uh, pray. Give us, God, insight into your word. Convict us of things that we are doing right, that we'll be, we'll be confirmed in those, and where we need to change or repent or uh, refocus. I pray that you would work in our hearts in that regard as well as we read from, from your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm resuming the series uh, from Luke's Gospel on giving oneself away. And we're picking up again in Luke chapter 6, starting with verse 12. Giving oneself away in prayer. It was at this time that Jesus went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Now, when it says at this time, this is in the middle of controversy with the Pharisees who are upset with Jesus for working on the Sabbath by healing people. Verse 11 said that they were already discussing, quote, what to do with him. They're, uh, I don't know if they're thinking assassination or uh, slander yet to try and get him in trouble with Rome, but they're wondering how they can shut this man down. <clears throat> and just when things are starting to heat up, Jesus spends a whole night in prayer. It says he went to the mountain. Now, this would be a place of solitude because there is less population there. Um, and there is more than one mountain retreat that Jesus had in the Gospels. We don't know what, which particular mountain this was, but it's a place of refuge and rest. Um, the opening phrase of verse 13 says, And when day came, indicates that there's a link between his night spent in prayer on the mountain and his selecting, uh, appointing 12 of his uh, disciples to be apostles. He spent the whole night there. Whenever I read that, I don't know about you, but I'm challenged because I don't know if I've spent, other than sleeping, I don't know if I've spent a whole night doing anything other than a couple times in college where I did an all-nighter and tried to stay up to cram for an exam or something. Uh, but definitely, uh, speaking of conviction, it's one of those things that, hmm, am I that concerned about connecting with my Heavenly Father to spend a whole night in prayer? And you can speculate as to what Jesus was praying about this whole time. I mean, if you spent half an hour in prayer, what would be what would you be praying for? Well, here's a whole night. Um, it doesn't say that he has special list or prayer requests. Uh, in fact, this is something Jesus often did. It may be, maybe not necessarily for a whole night, but Luke 5 says that Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness to pray, just to spend time with his father. It would make sense that Jesus would talk with his father about the current situation, about going wider with his public ministry, about facing the opposition, and particularly about selecting 12 of the disciples around him to be apostles. Giving oneself away, though, is to give oneself away to dependable disciples. It says in verse 13, And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also named as apostles. Now he called his disciples to him, which implies, well, think this through. He's on a mountain. How does he call people to join him? Except there must have been somebody with him that night on the mountain. Maybe they didn't pray all night, but they were with him so that he could send one or two of his uh, friends or apostle, uh, disciples to go and gather people to join him on the mountain. We're not told who the runner was, who the messenger was, but that's probably what happened. Now, this occurs after Jesus had already called disciples. There's a couple terms here. One is disciple, one's apostle. More on that in a moment. Um, but Peter described them as men who accomplished, this is from Acts chapter 1, where Peter describes these disciples as men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. This was when they're discussing who to, how to replace Judas. That there were others that had spent this entire three years traveling with Jesus. Now, 
maybe not 365 days out of the year, but certainly that they were constantly um, involved in Jesus' ministry. This included women as well as men, uh, and a lot of them are anonymous. We don't know who they were. But at this point, Jesus isn't recruiting disciples. He's commissioning 12 apostles, and he chose 12 of them. I, I don't think God necessarily gave him this list of names ahead of time, even while, though he spent a whole night in prayer. I don't think he came down from the mountain and, or, or, or stayed on the mountain and gathered people to him and, and said, okay, here's the list. Here's the roster that God the Father has given to me. Because why would you gather all these people together when you only need to select 12 of them? Um, I don't think it was done to let others know that they didn't make the cut, as it were. Um, and it wasn't necessary to make a public announcement of, okay, here's the 12, everybody, these are, these are the apostles. I think it would be evident who they were. <clears throat> Rather, I think this was something like when Samuel... Uh, went to Jesse's home to select the next king of Israel. Saul had, was being deposed by God himself, and God sent Samuel to choose the new king, anoint the new king out of Jesse's household. And one by one, starting with the eldest, they all came forward, and you know there are a few times when Samuel thought, well, this is the one, he looks, he looks good, he looks strong, he's tall and brave and handsome or whatever, and God said, no, 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 no. And finally... It comes down to, oh, we have a son out in the, uh, in the folds, out in the uh, pastures with the sheep. David comes and God says, this is the one. This is the man. Anoint him. Um, I suspect that's what happened when Jesus appointed these apostles, that Jesus met with the larger group of disciples and God said, okay, this one, this one, this one, this one. So what's so special about these 12? Well, apostello literally means sent out one. Somebody who was sent out, somebody who was commissioned to go out. And during Jesus' time on earth, there were times when he would send them out um, on various missions to minister and heal and to cast out demons, uh, to teach. Um, one of my instructors in seminary was a guy by the name of Robert Coleman who wrote a book, it's a thin little book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And it's built on a larger book, Training of the Twelve. And the premise is that there was a strategic plan of giving oneself away through others. That Jesus um, knew that he would be taken up into heaven after the resurrection. He didn't write a book while he was here on earth. He didn't organize the church while he, were, he was here on earth. Those came later. He had promised them that the Holy Spirit would come, that his spirit would come upon them. But Jesus knew that after his earthly ministry and his death and resurrection and ascension, somebody would have to carry out the work. Somebody would have to spread the good news. And so he was giving of himself, giving himself away while he was with people. But part of that was giving of himself to these 12 men so that they could continue on the work. And then we come to this list of the apostles, and I'll comment on most of them. Verse 14 says there was Simon whom he, Jesus, also named Peter. Now, Peter was usually the first to speak among the 12, and he was their de facto leader uh, during and uh, after Jesus' ministry. And Andrew, his brother. Now, even though Peter was the leader, Andrew is the one who first recognized Jesus as the Messiah. John says in his gospel, one of the two who heard Jesus speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, meaning the Christ. And then Andrew brings Peter to Jesus and Jesus says, you are Simon, the son of John, you will be called Cephas. Well, then there's also in this list, uh, going back to Luke 6, there's James and John, more fishermen, the sons of Zebedee, and Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder. I, I couldn't help but think of uh, Glenn and how he likes to come up with nicknames for people. He doesn't always tell people what he's nicknamed them, but he has nicknames. Well, Jesus had nicknames, and he renamed Peter, and he renamed uh, James and John the Sons of Thunder. There was Bar Bar Philip and Bartholomew. Um, and there's organic connections in more than one place in this list. Uh, and that might give you some insight into how Jesus strategized to build the church, 
that there were organic connections. It wasn't just arbitrary, okay, well, you fit the profile, I have your uh, resume, CV, whatever, and well, I think you'd be good in this position. No, there was relationships that he built on. Uh, John chapter 1 talks about how Jesus purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. So I don't know this, but it it's likely that at least Philip knew Peter and Andrew before he became a disciple, and maybe it was through them that Jesus met Philip. But it does say that Philip found Nathaniel, just like Andrew realized he'd met the Messiah and brought Peter's brother. Philip goes to his friend Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote Jesus of Nazareth. But Philip recruited Nathanael, not Bartholomew. There's a little bit of confusion here because in the list of disciples in John, you have Nathanael, but not Bartholomew. Then there's a couple ways that... Uh, Scholars have tried to resolve this. One is um, the prefix B-A-R, bar, means son of. And it could be that Bartholomew was actually, his name was Nathaniel, son of uh, Tholomaeus, Bartholomew. Uh, and um, there's other explanations that you could have for this, but essentially it's the same man. Or perhaps Jesus nicknamed uh, Nathaniel as Bartholomew or in any case, um, it's the same man. Uh, later on, James, there's two uh, men by the name of James in Jesus' apostles, and one was the son of Alphaeus, and Judas Iscariot is later known as the son of Simon. So it is not uh, unlikely that Nathaniel could be known as bar Tholomaeus. <clears throat> but there's more than one apostle. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped over Simon, who was called the Zealot. Uh, the Zealots of that period mixed religion and politics to overthrow Rome. That was their goal and their objective. Um, I, I'm always intrigued how Jesus selected, you know, fishermen, Matthew the tax collector, and here's this radical who was uh, ready to um, do what it took to overthrow Rome. And, you know, throw in a little bit of religion with politics, and that can get volatile, hence the name or the term zealot. Giving oneself away through these apostles, though, um, leaves one more name in the list. Verse 16. Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So there's two, two apostles by the name of Judas. Judas, the son of James, but then there's Judas Iscariot as well. By the Last Supper, Jesus had clearly tagged Judas as a traitor. But much earlier on, Jesus said in John uh, chapter 6, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And in Jesus' prayer in John 17, it's called the High Priestly Prayer, Jesus prayed to the Father, While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus didn't make Judas a traitor, but mystery of mysteries, Jesus, I think, knew from the very start that Judas would betray him, and yet he chose him anyway. He knew that this man was a traitor and that he would help fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Yet that didn't stop Jesus from giving him a commission to be a sent one. Judas defaulted and betrayed Jesus and then committed suicide. So he never did get to spread the word. Um, and I think the lesson for us is that as we give of ourselves to others, we don't always know who might turn around and betray us even though we've given of ourselves and our time and our efforts. But does set an example that giving isn't limited to people who will be responsive to our sacrifice, and they may not be responsive to the grace of God, but God still offers his love, and so should we. 
Next, we come to Jesus' giving of oneself to strangers in need. Now, there's a group of disciples on the mountain. Twelve of them have been chosen as apostles, and they come down from the mountain, and there's people waiting for them. It says in verse 17, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples. So there's a, when it says disciples, that's a very generic term. There are some disciples that have been um, up on the mountain with Jesus, 12 are selected to be apostles, but now here's another larger group of followers at the foot of the mountain on the plain. A large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. I didn't look up the Greek of the difference between crowd and throng, but you get the picture that there's people who are coming not necessarily because they want to follow Jesus or commit their life to him, but they want something from Jesus. Or they're just simply curious. The apostles will be sent out on some missions later on, but now they're starting to get a feel for what it's like to deal with a whole crowd of people and what it will mean to give oneself away. Verse, verse 18 says that this great throng of people who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. Uh, we were just praying earlier for uh, Caleb being deployed to help with the hospitals in Sioux City or elsewhere. We're not sure where he's going to be uh, working yet with the National Guard, but, you know, he just, oh, being sent to deal with sick people. And yet these are the people in need. And very few of us would be called in this way to give of ourselves to a crowd. Uh, I've had opportunity to speak to groups that, you know, are three digits at most. Um, but whether it's a crowd or not, we're still called to give of ourselves to strangers because these are people that the disciples didn't know, Jesus didn't know, but they knew them. They knew where they could come for healing and hope. Um, if you look at the, the makeup of this crowd and, and the people who had been assembling before, they come from other countries. They're people of different cultures people with different understandings of the world and how it works, different worldviews. But they're people in need of healing. They're people who need to be rescued from Satan's clutches. Um, I've only encountered a demonic situation once or twice in my ministry um, where it was very obvious that something like an exorcism was necessary. But normally... Satan doesn't like to show up in that way in our culture, and people don't even recognize when Satan's at work, but we definitely have people who are living in darkness, and they're under his thumb and need to be freed. And lastly, we come to Jesus giving of himself by sharing his energy. Now, I'm, I'm using that term very loosely here. <clears throat> but verse 19 says, all the people were trying to touch him. Now, you can, I can't imagine what it would be like to be in a crowd and all these people are jostling around trying to get, I, I'd, be, I'd be suffocating. You know, no social distancing here. <laughs> They're crowding in trying to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. So even those that he didn't address or talk to specifically, um, and again, this is not a direct correlation. I don't think God has given, given us the power to walk up and down the streets and people just reach out and touch us and they're healed. But this did happen more than once in Jesus' ministry. We have one specific example in Luke chapter 8 where there's a woman with a hemorrhage and she'd been to doctor after doctor, spent all her money on doctors. None of them could cure her. And so she, you know, she's embarrassed, but she sneaks up through the crowd and reaches out to touch the fringe of Jesus' cloak and she's healed. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding in and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. And then the lady comes forward and admits, I'm, I'm the one. And, and uh, this didn't yet diminish his power to heal. But I think there's a reason why Jesus... Like fell, could fall asleep in a boat in the middle of a storm. There are days when he was just worn out. Because even though he had divine power, he was also a man and he had his limits. Which is why in Mark 6, 
He told the disciples, and I think he probably did this more than once, he said, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while, for there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. I'm sure you have had days like that where you get so busy with work, oh, no wonder I'm hungry, I didn't have lunch today. Well, that happened a lot with Jesus and the disciples. So giving of ourselves means giving of our energy. Now, again, I'm not thinking divine power flowing out of our body to heal somebody who just touches us, but if we're going to give of ourselves, it's going to require work. And work wears you out sometimes. Um, I remember hearing years ago that, well, if you're, if you're operating according to your spiritual gifts, you should be energized by exercising your spiritual gifts. It shouldn't wear you down. Well, yes and no. I mean, there are ways that... Um, if we're operating by God's direction and guidance, he gives strength when you don't think you have any more left. But it is giving of oneself, and it may be giving of our energy in a very direct way. And so let's turn to God in prayer and ask us, ask him to send us out. We ask you, God, to send us with the grace to pray, the grace to invest in others, to even give to those who may turn against us or to give to strangers we may never see again. In the name and by the example and power of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.